Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. There's another paid request this time for Jacob. He wanted me to do another video reacting to another lecture of this guy named Leonard Sustained. Uh, this one on what's behind the horizons of black holes. And uh, we'll see what happens. For those interested, requesting pretty much any type of videos or topics, randomness. Reactions, reviews, re reviews, whatever it may be, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. So let's get right into it. Let's see what this is like. Okay, you can press play anytime. Stanford University. Let's uh, begin. I'm going to begin with my interests. And this is very rapidly going to get into what I'm interested in and what I've been working on. Mm. But let's, uh, let's talk in a little bit of generalities first. The subject is quantum mechanics. Great. And the subject is gravity and the relationship between them. I like the movie Gravity. Offhand, it sounds like maybe there isn't much relationship between them. <coughs> Gravity is about the biggest things in the world, the biggest and heaviest things in the world. Oh, I see a whole bunch of people coming. All right, wait a second. Uh, I don't have my glasses on, but I think I recognize it. Is that Bartek? <laughs> Hi, Bartek. He's one of our <laughs> one of our most important members of the SITP, I would say. Also very young. Um, right. Offhand, you might think gravity doesn't have much to do with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is about the very small and the very light, that which is so delicate that when you touch it, it does something, uh, it jumps around and does all sorts of things because it's so small and so light. And gravity is about exactly the opposite, things which are so big and so heavy that in a sense they're the biggest and heaviest things that physics is about. Thank you, Professor Xavier. And so what do they have to do with each other? Not much, you might think. But they come together in one special place. <coughs> black holes. Black holes are both highly quantum mechanical objects and, of course, highly gravitating objects. A lot of black holes, a lot of black booty That's holes. That's the portal into the connection between quantum mechanics and gravity. Connection to the Hershey the Highway. of gravity is geometry. Geometry of space and time. The essence of quantum mechanics, well, various people would say there are different essences of quantum mechanics, but I think we're sort of converging over the years that the essence of quantum mechanics is entanglement. The strange difference between classical physics and quantum physics is largely encoded in the phenomena of entanglement. And another concept also that we will talk about. There's like Amber Heard should be in some entanglements. Complexity. These are the things I'm interested in and what is happening is we're beginning to see the <coughs> ideas of quantum mechanics be encoded in geometry in surprising ways that we never expected. The deepest principles of quantum mechanics, the strangeness of quantum mechanics, the weirdness of quantum mechanics, Apparently, what's happening is it's all being encoded and understood as aspects of geometry. I feel like I'm listening to the dialogue when the in when the John Carper's Prince of Darkness. That we're studying quantum mechanically happen to be black holes. So that's what I'm going to tell you about largely. What I'm going to Will Smith's said, career right now, a black people hole. people have different thoughts than I do. They're all wrong, but that's... Uh, <laughs> oh, they are. But... Uh, Okay, so I'm going to begin with a concept that's called ER. I've seen that show. Now, who can fill in the rest? There's at least three people in the audience that I know can fill in the rest. Ernie Ladd. Equals EPR. EPR. ER and EPR stand for names of people. And on the left-hand side, as you might expect, an E, what does E stand for? E stands for Einstein. Who else could it stand for? 
Einstein. On the right-hand side, E stands for Einstein. On the left-hand side, R stands for Rosen. You probably never heard of Rosen. He was a minor physicist of, uh, who collaborated with Einstein, sort of one of his assistants. So the R's on both sides are the same. And the P in the middle is Podolsky, who was also a, a good physicist, but a relatively minor one. Not that minor, the guy's on the left -hand initial side up there. stands for a paper that was written by Einstein and Rosen in 1935, very much toward the end of Einstein's productive career. In fact, a lot of people up until recently would have said it had exceeded his, uh, his time as an influential physicist. <clears throat> EPR stands for a fundamentally quantum mechanical idea, entanglement. Left-hand side, geometry the geometry of black holes in particular, the right-hand side, a fundamental quantum concept of entanglement. And again, it stands for a paper that was written by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in the same year, 1935. The two papers apparently had nothing to do with each other. It was, this was usually credited as the paper which recognized the importance of entanglement or recognized the strangeness of entanglement. Paper was sent and to the, the Marx Brothers. Side had to do with black holes. It has turned out that they are so deeply related that one can almost put an equal sign between them. That they are so deeply connected, joined at the hip, the idea of Einstein-Rosen bridges and Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen entanglement. So I'm going to tell you about that, and then I'm going to tell you, not tonight, I don't think, about a concept that is developing, or at least in my imagination is developing, called computational complexity. The relationship, strangely, it's a relationship between concepts from computer science and concepts from quantum mechanics and gravity. So that's what this course is about. Yay. Okay, let's start with entanglement, though. Now, as I said, this course is for people who have the basics, who have learned, let me call it the theoretical minimum, and I am not going to spend time uh, explaining things which I assume that an incoming graduate student who has had a good education in quantum mechanics and a good education in general relativity would be likely to know. That's the starting point. Well, right, then so I'm out. Entanglement. Entanglement is a thing that can happen between systems, between pairs of systems. Because I never systems. cared about quantum mechanics. I was never interested in quantum mechanics. I never cared like to be spin. taught it quantum be mechanics. Down or like a coin. It can be does it, it, there's tails. nothing in but my everyday life. Because I've never been confronted with a black hole. And well, <laughs> two qubits, maybe if you know, states are labeled either different kind of black hole. You can have an entangled superposition of them. This is an entangled superposition. One of them is up. The other Depends on what down. she's into. But. Minus, down, up. This is called a bell pair. And it stands for the state of a two-qubit system. And it says, very simply, the two-qubit system is such that if the first qubit is up, the second one is definitely down. Is that the contra code? And if the, second one is, if the first one is down, up, the up, first down, is down, up. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. There's a correlation between them. If you had these two entangled qubits, incidentally, they could be far apart. You could make the qubit pair and then take them far. Qubit stands for quantum bit. Uh, if you made the qubit pair, a bit of information as, a, as inside a computer. Um, if you made the qubit pair, you could take them far apart from each other. And then, because of the structure of this state, you can say there's a correlation. If Bob over here measures his qubit and it's up, he um. knows instantly that Alice is down. Alice, Alice's qubit. If Bob's is down, then he knows that Alice is up. Now that in itself is not so weird. <clears throat> the way I usually like to describe this is I uh, give one person a coin, which is a, a penny, the other person a coin, which is a dime. They don't know which is which. And I tell him to go out of the room. We never actually carry this out. The reason we never carry it out is because I never have a coin in with me. Not having a coin, I feel perfectly free instead to do it with a $10,000 bill and a $1 bill. 
But this is all air money. I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, so we have, here's a $10,000 bill. Art, you get one of them, and uh, Sanjay gets another one. You don't have to stand up, I'll just pretend. Okay, so I mix them up. They're different. Real sugar and uh, chemical sugar. <laughs> and behind my back, and I give one to Art and one to Sanjay. I tell him to go out of the room. And then the amazing fact is the minute that Art, the second that Art opens up his package and discovers what it is, he knows instantly what Sanjay's is. How can that be? No, that, that doesn't seem very amazing, does it? It's just obvious. That's called correlation. Entanglement is a form of correlation, but in a moment I will tell you what the difference is. It's the state of being correlated for two coins or two, uh, or, uh, two uh, bills is really got something to do with the fact that you didn't really know everything about the system that you could have known, that in principle could be known. In particular, somebody could have done a very, very delicate experiment without anybody even recognizing it. For example, by sending, in, sending into the room a very, very, very um, low-energy radio wave. A radio wave with maybe just a couple of quanta in it. And those quanta might bounce off the objects and record which one was which without making any difference to the experiment. Classical mechanics is like that. You can measure things, you can look at them without changing them. You have a pair of coins, you can look at the coin without causing it to flip. Quantum mechanics is different. Quantum mechanics, when you look at something, you cause it to change. The peculiar thing about entanglement, the very, very strange thing about entanglement, is that knowing the quantum state in this form is everything that can possibly be known about those two qubits. There is no more to be known. A quantum state like this is a full, the fullest possible description of the two qubits, uh -huh. and yet it says nothing whatever about what either one of them is doing. Right. It is equally likely that the first qubit is up as that it is down. So it is a state of being which is absolutely the maximum you can know about the system, and yet you know nothing about the individual constituents. That sounds crazy from a classical viewpoint. From a classical viewpoint, if you know everything that there is to know about something, then you know everything there is to know about the parts of the system. An entangled state like this is a state in which you know everything about the system that can be known, and yet in this case you know nothing about either of the constituents. Hmm. That's the notion of entanglement. Now, incidentally, for those who know about spin, you know you could measure the spin along other axes, not just up or down. They have different versions of entanglements, right? right? And it has the same property, that if Alice comes along and measures instead of the upness or downness of this qubit, she measures the inness or outness of it, she will immediately know what Bob's qubit is doing in the same way, in the same, with respect to the same thing. She'll know that if she makes a measurement and this qubit is out, then Bob's is in. If this qubit is in, then Bob's is out. What? So, it's something which is correlation, but it's a much more fundamental concept than just the statistical, or just the, um, the fact that you may not have known which one of these I gave to Sanjay, which one I gave to, um, uh, to Art. But somebody could have known. Not with entanglement. So entangled states are very special, and they really do characterize... In I was lost at the $10,000 bill. I mean... Quantum mechanics. Almost everything that's strange about quantum mechanics, that's really strange about it, things which are the really bizarre logic of it, traces back to entanglement. Now, can you make Stupid macroscopic thing. objects which... Oh, there's another thing about... You know, let me just say what it is. It has the property that you can find out any piece of information about what Alice is holding by making a measurement on what Bob is holding. This is the character of entanglement. You can find out everything you want to know 
or anything you want, not everything, but anything you want to know about what Bob is holding, Alice can find out by measuring her own system, by doing an experiment on her own system. Mm. All right, can this, are there macroscopic versions of this? Can you take large-scale objects and entangle them? Or can you, can you create large-scale objects which are entangled in this way? Remember, they have the property that although you know everything about the combined system, you know nothing about its parts. No way. Or you cannot know anything about its parts. And you can find out anything about one of them by doing a measurement on the other one. Yes, you can. Here's how you can make a macroscopic system. Um, first question is, how do you make entangled pairs like this? Well, there's an easy way. You just create particle pairs. You can create particle pairs, for example, electron-positron pairs in the laboratory by colliding photons together, all sorts of ways of doing it. When the electrons and the, po and the positrons come out, they are entangled. In fact, their spins are entangled in exactly this fashion. So you can easily create pairs of particles that live in this, or that uh, have this funny relationship between them. So you create a pair. The V here stands for the creation of the pair. I feel like Homer fucking way, Simpson again, man. Off the other way. Well, what do you have? You have two entangled particles separated from each other. And you put Doesn't kind of look like Homer Simpson, you too, so it works. Here too. And then you do it again. You create another entangled pair. And now this box has two particles. This box has two particles. And this one is entangled with... So you keep doing it. You keep doing it over and over and over again until you fill these boxes with large numbers of particles, there may be enough of them to create an interesting macroscopic object in each of these boxes, and those objects are fully entangled. They have this property that you can find out anything you want about one of them by doing a measurement on the other. So entanglement is not restricted to small objects. Large-scale objects can be entangled. Now, of course, uh, where we're going is we're going to be talking about black holes. Any questions about entanglement? I would refer you to the, to the, uh, the lecture notes that I gave on entanglement, and uh, there we are. Now, you might think in order to have entanglement, you have to have some particles. You have to have something to be entangled. In fact, even just empty space is entangled. So to understand how empty space is entangled, the first thing you have to understand, of course, is that in quantum mechanics, empty space has properties. Uh, it's not really so empty. It can have virtual particles in it. It has fluctuations of the oh field. Oh my god, Classical there's an physics, hour and a half left of this. The vacuum. The state with nothing Jesus. in it. The state with no photons or no radiation in it. The electromagnetic field, for example, is just plain zero. It's just plain zero. There is no electromagnetic field. But in quantum mechanics, in the empty space, the field fluctuates. Sometimes you look at it, it could be positive. Sometimes you look at it, it could be negative. Translated into photons, some of the time, in a little box someplace. Draw on the photon, the photon if you look for it. torpedoes. You know we're talking about empty space. Sometimes you would not find the photon. So if you take empty space and you make measurements on it, you get non-trivial results. Not just zero, but you sometimes find a particle, sometimes you don't find a particle. And here's what entanglement has to say. It's cool if Jacob is into Let's this stuff. Apparently things. I'm just not... I'm drawing, I'm using the blackboard to represent One of them. Space. The left side and the right side. But we side. all have our different interests. And let's divide space into little cells. We all have our different our interests. In this is definitely boundary. not mine. I'm not really doing anything. I'm doing a mathematical imaginary operation both in dividing no the wonder space why in the middle I never died and quantum in making <laughs> believe that it's made up of little cells. Physics. So now we can do a measurement of Brown. the field or we could look we, we could look for a virtual particle. We could look for one of these vacuum fluctuating particles in here, and we could look in here. I know for Jacob, he said All he finds find this stuff interesting. I didn't no teach their own. The right, right side, there will be no I don't the see side. it. 
I don't get it, but that's cool. Right side, like I say we all have different tastes. So we could write the quantum state of these two here by saying if one of them is empty, call it zero, then the other one is empty. If we find a particle in it, then we will find another particle in the other hole. It looks very much, where did I erase it? It looks very much like an entangled state here. You can find out by looking in the left little cell here whether there's a particle here just by the correlation between them. This is a form of entanglement. And it's a form of entanglement that's there in empty space between parts of space. between these two cells? Are they very close? Can they yeah, they, they, they begin very close. But we can also look at larger ones a little bit further away. And we find that they're entangled with each other. This with this, this with this, this with this, in pretty much the same pattern. And in fact, there's a general pattern. It's called scale invariance or conformal invariance. And we find that regions are entangled with each other if they're near each other. This one over here is not entangled with this. If you make a measurement of a particle in here, you'll find out nothing about this. It's just too far away. But you will find out if there's a particle here, there's probably one here. Same thing in this bigger box here. If there's a particle in here, there's probably one in here. If there's one in here, there's probably one in here, if there's, and so forth. So this entangles is a pattern to this entanglement. And it's thought, it's actually thought, this is a quantum property, but it really is beginning to be thought, I don't, I don't know how to describe this, except to say, you think it's so fundamental that it, in a sense, holds space together. We know that if we were to destroy this entanglement, entanglement can be destroyed. Entanglement can be destroyed by making measurements. There are all sorts of ways of destroying entanglement. I don't know why, just picture in the Star Wars Simply universe looking at the system. someone once, doing the same thing to prove once, uh, the quantum physics of the Art force. Looks at his sugar packet, he knows which one it, it is. binds together. And he each knows other. what he has, he now knows what Sanjay has. There's no more entanglement between them. They now know. There's no more, uh, they know what they have. So a by looking professor at system, in Star Wars is playing the quantum mechanics of the, same thing the force. <laughs> Space. They would all Ryan Johnson. Observation you do that for you. That's fucking Star Wars movie. And determine whether there is a particle in them or not, and that destroys the entanglement. It also does something else. It creates a huge amount of energy in the region where you made the experiment. Remember, in quantum mechanics, when you look at something, you change it. You affect it. And in this particular case, if you look at what's in here, you affect the system and you create a huge energy in here. Now, huge energies are sources of gravitational effects. They change the geometry. They change what space actually looks like. And in fact, they disconnect the space. They disconnect the space. They sort of unzip it. Space is zipped together by entanglement. Um, this is one of the things we've learned by thinking about gravity and quantum mechanics at the same time, that entanglement is important, in a sense, for holding the parts of space together. Without mm -hmm. it, they would, uh, space would not have its nice coherent structure, its contiguous structure of parts being adjacent to other parts. So entanglement is not only a feature of electrons, it's a feature of everything, including empty space. Now, entanglement has another property, one which is very important. It's called monogamy, the same kind of monogamy that I hope you people all enjoy, <laughs> that I have enjoyed. Uh, where's the fun in that? What does entanglement of monogamy mean? No, monogamy of entanglement. It's easy to explain if you have three qubits. Imagine you have three qubits. You can call them Alice's qubit, Bob's qubit, and Charlie's qubit. Alice, Bob, and Charlie are quantum physicists' way of um, 
saying A, B, and C. Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So hmm. each one has a qubit. Actually, you call A art, couldn't we? All right, but then as we have to do S for Sanjay. All right, Alice, Bob, and the uh, right. Now, it could be that Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit are entangled. If, and that means that Alice can look at her qubit and find out information about Bob's. It correlated. In fact, anything about Bob's qubit, Alice can find out by looking at the appropriate thing for her qubit. But they will find out nothing about Charlie's qubit if Alice and Bob are entangled. On the other hand, it is possible for Alice and Charlie to be entangled, in which case Bob is um, the third wheel of the... What do you call it when three people... That, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Threesome. Uh, melange the toile or whatever. Uh, uh, Threesome. A love triangle, right? A love triangle. So you can only be... Technically, I'm talking about something called maximal entanglement, but, uh, but let's just call it entanglement. When two things are entangled, they are entangled with each other. When they're they together, they drop the third one off the next the, block. That's the monogamy of entanglement. And it's a deep and basic principle of quantum mechanics that uh, entanglement is Or as Steven Seagal would say, open the door and drop the bitch out. Now I've actually taught you enough to explain a paradox. The paradox is a very deep paradox. Among physicists, it's sometimes called the Amps Paradox. Oh my god. Amps does not stand for a unit of electrical current. It stands for four physicists. Almeri, who was a graduate student, Marolf, and who's now here as a postdoc, Marolf, who's a famous general relativity expert, Polchinski, who's just a famous physicist, and Sully, who was also a graduate student who uh, contributed to the study. They discovered what looked like a very fundamental paradox. So that's what happened to Sully. And entanglement. Long way from monsters. So i what that paradox was. You start with a black hole. Will Smith. Black hole has a horizon. Well, I mean, this be Jada Pink yet. The black line represents the horizon of the black hole. Inside is the interior black of the hole. black hole. Outside is the exterior of the black hole. Interior is inside. Jada Pink is definitely a black hole. Outside. <laughs> and according to Einstein, the according to uh, when I say Einstein, according to the general theory of relativity, the horizon is just a point of no return. Things can fall through the horizon. Well, it's this career. Things fall through the horizon, and when they pass through the horizon, they just find an empty space. Empty space, vacuum. The horizon, or the vicinity of the horizon, on both sides, just looks like a continuous um, space in which both sides are just the opposite side of a, uh, of a vacuum, of empty space. Jada Pink is hard. Somebody falling into the black hole will simply experience nothing special. Now, but we've already found that if things are like empty space, nevertheless there is this entanglement. Now, these things are not easy to measure. You don't go and measure a vacuum fluctuation um, with a, uh, um, I don't know, what do you use to measure things when you want to measure? A ruler or a... Um, what? A multimeter. <laughs> multimeter, right. right. It, it, you got to be delicate. It's hard to do, but you can do it. Um, so when... Who, who do we send into the black hole? This is, gets to be a uh, question now. Do we send Bob into the black hole or Alice? I usually send Bob into the black hole. I used to send Alice in, and then I got a lot of complaints about it. So I'm going to send Bob into the black hole. Now, Bob is going to do experiments as he falls through. Maybe he's even going to make an experiment like the, like one of these experiments here. And he ought to find that space, the properties of space, are very, very similar to what they would be 
in the empty vacuum, the empty vacuum not really being so empty. Hmm. So, if that's true, then as he falls through, he might make a measurement of what's going on over here. He might look, for example, for a, uh, for a, for a virtual particle, and then he might also make an experiment over here. And these two experiments, or these two degrees of freedom, should be entangled. Why? Because empty space is entangled in this way. Mm. So let's label the things that Bob could measure. Let's call this one B. And this one B A. These do not stand for Bob and Alice now. They are just in front of the horizon and behind the horizon. Mr. Asshole and Mr. I use Bubble. B and A because we've been using B and A for these for a long time. B and A, they don't stand, they could stand for Bob and Alice, but we already agreed that Bob was the one who went into the black hole, so it's screwed up notation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bob, but that's not Bob, that's just a little vacuum fluctuation over here, and the other one is a little vacuum fluctuation over here, and they ought to be entangled. But let's suppose that for one reason or another, and I'll give you a reason in a moment, that this black hole happens to be entangled, highly entangled, with some other system over here. How could that be? How could it have gotten entangled? Well, let me give you an example. The, the, uh, the example that uh, Amps used was this black hole might have evaporated for a period, and if you collect together all the evaporation products, they will be entangled with the original black hole. But we don't need to do that. We could do it more simply. We could imagine, since we're in the business of Gedanken experiments, thought experiments, and the purpose of thought experiments is to analyze the consistency of, um, of principles, we can build these black holes to be entangled from the first place. I showed you a little while ago how you can create two macroscopic objects which are entangled. You simply create them out of material which was entangled to begin with. Particles, which individually, this one with this one, this one with this one, were entangled. So you do the same thing. You collect these entangled particles in buckets. Each particle in the left is entangled with something in the right. Wonder Woman's and then tits. you create enough of them that gravity pulls them together and makes a black hole out of each side. That's something we think should be, in principle, possible. If we do that, what we wind up is with two entangled black holes. We have two entangled black holes. Find out anything you want about one of them by looking at the other cap here. But I also told you that for the horizon to make sense and to look like empty space, the things just on this side of the horizon have to be entangled with the things on the other side. And now we have a monogamy problem. The monogamy problem is that B is a bigamist. And bigamy is forbidden, not only by law, but by uh, physical law. So this, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Bigamist. One possible answer is that if a black hole is created, entangled with another object, it doesn't have to be another black hole, it could be anything. But if it's in particular, if it's created and tangled with another object, then something happens to the interior of this black hole and wipes it out. Creates nothingness in here. By nothingness, I don't mean empty space. I mean nothing. And that means that if somebody fell into it, they couldn't fall in because there's nothing there. That's called a firewall. The idea, a firewall of the kind, uh, you know, that, that creates an absolute barrier to where anything could go from outside the black hole to inside. No inside, because if there was an inside, and in particular, if it was possible to pass smoothly through here, as if the, as if the horizon was empty space, this would have to be entangled with this. But, by assumption, it's entangled with that. So we have, we have this problem. And um, the conclusion that Amps drew, Almeri, Polchinski, Moroff, and Sully, 
was that the, what this means is that if a black hole does, for some reason, become entangled with another system like this, it just doesn't have an inside. There is no inside. On the other hand, everything we knew about general relativity, everything that Einstein taught us, said, no, the interior of black holes exist, makes just as much sense as regions of space as the outside, and somebody falling in should fall in smoothly. So this is a paradox. This is, and it's a real paradox. It's a genuine one. The solution, I don't think, and I don't think too many people, including the, the inventors of the paradox, are at all convinced that their solution is right, the firewall solution, but it's a real paradox. And it's a thing that, uh, that has driven me for the last two years. This is conflict of principle. This is conflict of principle between Einstein general relativity on the one hand and, um, and quantum mechanics on the other hand. Conflicts of principle like this, when they're unraveled, and when one understands what's going on, often lead to the biggest advances in our understanding of physics. So this can't stay that way. You can't just leave it and say, oh, well, okay, it seems like a paradox. It's really at the core of things, at the core of the relation between gravity and quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's see. What, uh, what is the possible solution? Talk about possible solutions. How B became... Well, we're postulating somehow that B... Remember, when a thing is highly entangled like this, and this was created in this very entangled state, you can find out anything about what's going on in this black hole by looking at what's going on in this one by construction. We constructed it that way. So we constructed the black hole in such a way that B is entangled with something in Alice's system here. That means there's something or other that Alice can measure in her system that would tell her about B. On the other hand, if the horizon really is smooth, if the horizon really, if Bob falls through the horizon, here's the, just a point of no return, but A is behind the horizon, and in our current understanding about thinking of black holes, the basic quantum state is composed out of things outside the horizon. And the interior is built in some other way. Could it possibly be? What's that? Which one, which one have to be? Uh, the left side one. The left side one, if this weren't a black hole, we wouldn't be talking about its interior. These devices should be closer to Yeah, here, which would not look like empty space exactly what we don't want to do for the black hole. So the question is, is it, one possible answer is what the AMP said, that a black hole, which is entangled with another thing, develops properties which are very different. I mean, positives, the guy are. seems like a nice now, guy, one way seems like a nice teacher, entangling the black will hole answer questions. Is just to let He's going slow enough black holes so that if you are into rate. this topic, you'd be when, as they evaporate, able to understand it better compared to someone that wants to talk like the Michael Machines guy a, a mile a minute and that give you a chance to breathe. It has a, the teacher has an easy going demeanor. It's, completely isolated in, uh, in it's just space, this topic and this subject and offers off. next to nothing for me. Little droplets will and be again, if Jacob and other people are cool and are into this, that's good. As the puddle shrinks, you can call me dumb, you can call me stupid, you can call me ignorant. It's just this is not my eventually interest at all. When there's enough evaporation product out there, the um, the bubble here will be just not my entry, not my taste, not my so the way that, um, interest that at the all. Imagined it, they imagined so I'm sorry. This object over here was really just the Hawking radiation that got out, went out. Now you could take that Hawking this radiation just does and collapse for it me. into a black hole, it would still be entangled with it. Yeah, it would just actually be entangled with the outgoing radiation, 
and uh, different parts in here would not be entangled uh, the way you might have expected. It would just be true. But, at the logical bit of information over here, they're too far away. This object could be off, I can just be something over here. That particle must have been there whether or not Alice made her disturbance. It's just too far away for it to matter. And so the conclusion was that there must be loads of particles behind here, one for each possible measurement that Alice could possibly do on this thing. That's what was called a firewall, and that was the basic paradox. That was the unhappy paradox that Amps concocted. The art was called Einstein Rosen Bridge afterwards. For those diagrams, light moves at 45 degrees. Oh, what the hell? It's a space time picture, time going up as usual, space going horizontal. It's a space time map of a black hole. Let me explain it to you. On these kind of diagrams, light moves at 45 degrees. The hell happened to the audio? Light moves at 45 degrees in the outward angle. If you're out here, this is spatial infinity. This is spatial infinity. Um, when I say it's a map of space and time, it's a distorted map of space and time. It's distorted in the same way that a repeated fraction of uh, the Earth is distorted. It's squeezed around in such a way as to be able to put all of space and time on the blackboard. So this is very far away over here. Okay, now the audio's back. Off at infinity. Huh. This is time infinity. The clock's going to infinity up here. Here's the horizon of a black hole, and here's the exterior of the black hole. The only thing you should notice is if some poor person happens to fall through this line here, they are trapped. This is the singularity of the black hole, and it's a bad place. It's a place where you won't survive. This is the horizon of the black hole. If you fall through there from the exterior region, you're dead. You're doomed. Anyway, you may not be dead, but you're doomed. You're going to hit that uh, singularity there. Now, this is the exterior of the black hole, but strangely, the black hole seems to have two exteriors. One on this side and one on this side, and you can fall through from this side or that side. Well, it's really two black holes. It's a black hole on this side, and it's a black hole on this side. They're, in a certain sense, infinitely far away from each other. You can't go around from one side to the other. You'll never get there. Here's a picture of what this Kruskal extension, and in what sense it's two black holes. It really represents two disconnected regions of space, completely disconnected. Here's a region of space. Or a space, space. That stands for space. Not space-time, but space. X. That's the right side. The left side, another region of space. And connecting them, you can go from one to the other by passing through something that John Wheeler called a wormhole. When you walk from here to here, right through that point, you walk through the horizon of one, and you show up just outside the horizon of the other. That's over here. There's the horizon. So, falling in, or crossing over, not falling in, but crossing over from here to here, crossing from here to here. Einstein and Rosen drew this picture Somebody called it an Einstein-Rosen bridge, and it stood for this diagram over here. It's two completely disconnected worlds that are only connected by virtue of this wormhole. It's a real solution of Einstein's equations. It exists. It exists mathematically. It has some properties. First of all, the region over here as you cross from here to here, is pure empty space. Nothing strange going on there. If you were able to pass from here to here, you would find nothing strange there. 
it's just empty space. That implies that there is entanglement between the side and the side. Entanglement across here. Another way to s Yeah, if you actually wanted to walk across there, yes, you would. But, <laughs> uh -huh. but we're not really walking across there. We're just talking about the properties of space from one side. In this picture, they're not two, they're not a connected space. We're exhibiting it here around the outside. But strangely, it has the property that you cannot go through the Einstein row. This is one property of Einstein rows and bridges that is important. You can't actually pass through them. You can see that. Where's our diagram? Here's our diagram. Can you get from this side to this side? Can you get from here to here at all? No point on this side over here can send a light signal that will ever get to this side. No point can send a signal that will get to the other side. But what can happen is they can meet at the center. So the meaning of that is, although you cannot send a signal through the Einstein-Rosen bridge, somebody could jump in from the side, jump in from the side, and meet at the center. Same thing here. If somehow this kind of thing could be manufactured, then these two places could be, as far as the external world goes, could be 10 billion light years or more around We could barely have enough damn food. We ain't gonna be able to make a damn black hole. Yes. And yet, if Alice jumps into her black hole and Bob jumps into his I mean, we live in a time where a fucking food prices are going up and That's gas prices are going thing, up. But it's a consequence. And we can't fix equations. that, but we're gonna what make do a fucking black do? hole. To make two black holes that have this kind of black hole bullshit on that. We're never going to go through a black hole. We're never going to meet a you know. If they're entangled, then they will have exactly this kind of connectivity. So if you can make black holes, which are entangled, and you can, you can make them by taking entangled collections of particles and collapsing them into black holes. They have the astonishing property that, in principle. Here's the, inside of the, here's the inside of the second black hole. There's the horizon. What we're talking about is a geometry. What the Einstein-Rosen bridge is, is it's a geometry that if you fall into here, you come out over here. Let's redraw it. Let's, well, you can see. If you fall into one, you appear in the interior of the other black hole. It's like the event this horizon. Point, this point are not really far apart. They're both inside, but Alice and Bob can jump in and uh, discover, um, uh, first of all, is the real properties of solutions of Einstein's equations. It, it appears... To, no. Uh, get to the outside of the other one. Yep. Anytime you have entanglement, a bit of this kind of thing happens and builds a kind of space time between the two things. Now, if they're just electrons and they're entangled, the um, nobody's going to jump into an electron. You can't get Alice and Bob to jump into different electrons at different places. The only content. Of the I'm sorry that I'm fast forwarding to it, but at impact. the same time. What this is saying is somehow when entanglement. You're not going to get anything out of me that's really funny or entertaining. Objects. And for those big, who are into this, it'd be best to watch this without big macroscopic this crappy. And, macroscopic objects are made and the reason I do things. stuff like this is because I don't want to steal like this person's video. I want people to go, you know what? If I want to watch this by itself, I don't want to just watch this guy's video. I want to actually go to the source. So that's why I do in such a low budget fashion. Because I think this is not too contentious. I think most of the if people want to watch this, then they'll go watch a better version 
and click on that video. Essentially, the entanglement is more, fun, is more fundamental. So entanglement creates space time. But I don't know that there, can be, there can exist things in space time that are not entangled. There can exist things in space time which are not entangled, and there will be no kind of spatial connectivity of that type. You can have two black holes which are not entangled. Absolutely, you can have things which are not entangled. Two black holes which are not entangled will not have this peculiar feature of a connectivity between them like this. Bob will jump into this one, Alice will jump into this one, and there is no chance at all that they will meet at the center if they're untangled. Is that assume that the, uh, the black hole existed from the beginning of time minus infinity? Ah, good, good point, good point, good point. Yeah. Um, this diagram, yes. But you can imagine that the upper half of this diagram, let's take the upper half of this diagram, well, in this fashion over here, that the upper half of this diagram represents the, follow, the following process. You started over here, in a sort of neutral position, neither on the left or the right, and you started creating entangled pairs, drawing either their own gravitational field, this is here, and remember that these are entangled with these. Let's represent the fact that they're entangled by drawing lines between them. This is simply a notational device to say this particle is entangled with that one, we put them between the jaws of a vice and we uh, squeeze both as it, and drop it into here and into here. Then, yes, you would make a very, very primitive Einstein Rosen bridge for which there is no particular meaning other than the fact that they're entangled, but you could draw it by saying there's a very two of them. Um, but yes, I would say yes, that, uh, that is right. Enough entanglement on large-scale space-time if the entanglement is strong enough. Only when you collect enough entanglement like this and collapse it do you make anything resembling ordinary space-time. But yes, I would say yes, that, uh, that is right. Um, The idea that time goes to zero at the horizon is just a statement that that's a point over there. You know, it does play a role, but the main role that it plays is saying that you can't escape outside. You can't escape from the inside to the outside. Um, oh, oh. No, this is kind of a slice through the center here. Now you can ask what happens. All right, good. There's an interesting issue here of what happens as time evolves. This is, this is the slice right through the middle here, which you can sort of think of as what happens when you first collapse the, the particles into the black hole. When you first take them, first they're particles, and then you collapse them, and you make this thing, that's just straight through here. So let's look at it. Starting here, I'm not literally walking, I'm just moving my finger from, uh, from one side to the other. In going from here to here, what you're doing is going out from out here through here, that's this point over here, and then going through and coming back out. But you can't do that without exceeding the speed of light. Okay. Nevertheless, there's an imaginary excursion walking across there, that's this. So this picture is what happens at t equals zero when the horizons are just touching. Okay. What happens later? What happens as time goes on? We're going to talk about this next time in greater detail. But as time goes on, the interesting part of the Einstein-Rosen bridge is the part behind the horizon. Once you fall through here, you're stuck in the interior of the black hole. You can't get out. You're going to hit the singularity. So this is the extended horizon over here. Mm -hmm. This is the extended horizon on the other side. 
And the interior of the Einstein-Rosen bridge, or the interior of this object, is what's in here. Now, notice an interesting property. As time goes forward, let's just draw time going forward like that, the Einstein-Rosen bridge grows. It started with the horizons touching each other. It started. Let's throw it this way. Right over here, the horizons are touching. That's what happens as you move in, you get to this point over here, that's right over here, and then you go out the other end. At that point, at time t equals zero, the Einstein-Rosen bridge is as short as it can be. Mm -hmm. As time goes forward, the horizons start to separate. The two horizons of the two black holes start to separate and leave between them a region of space. Uh -huh. So what does that look like? That looks like but, uh... this thing starts to grow. <laughs> starts to grow and grow and grow. It starts to stretch. It doesn't shrink, but it starts to stretch. If you work out Einstein's equations, you will discover that, uh, that the solution grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in going from up here to across here, it's infinitely far, way up in these corners here. Way up in these corners. So as time goes forward, this Einstein-Rosen bridge grows. Its growth is one of the reasons that you have such a hard time sending a signal completely through the, the, the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Right. You can't. And it's because... As you're trying to send the signal through, it's growing. Right. It's growing fast. It grows basically with the speed of light. So the Einstein-Rosen bridge grows with time. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting question. What properties of the quantum mechanics are encoding this growth of the Einstein? By longer and longer equilibrium millisecond, thermal equilibrium, and nothing happens after that. All sorts of interesting things happen in between, but nothing interesting happens after that. A very short amount of time between everybody. And, um, hopefully, this record will be of some interest to people. It'll be public, it'll be available, and um, I'm hoping it will be interesting. Anyway, um, it really does not involve... I'm telling you what I think, that I think we'll take up next time, and it's the paradox of complexity, of quantum complexity. Now, as I said, I'm telling you what I think. The, uh, the purpose of these lectures is for us to lay out what we're thinking about here, um, what you will find, of course, is that ongoing research, as it happens, is generally does not involve consensus between everybody. So this is not a thing which has reached the stage of consensus, but this is what I think. This is going to go into a historical record. This historical record will be a record of the research that's performed at SITP by the various people who do it. And a hundred years from now, historians will come and they will look at it. And what will they say about this? We'll find out. Uh, and um, hopefully this record will be of some interest to people. It'll be public, it'll be available, and um, I'm hoping it will be interesting. Anyway, um, let's see, should we go on a little bit or not? Yeah, let me tell you a little more, a little bit more. How do you make entangled black holes? Well, I told you one way to make entangled black holes is to take a bunch of uh, entangled particles and then collapse them. But it's by no means obvious that that makes a uh, black hole with a wormhole, two black holes with wormholes between them.
That's a sort of guess. But there is a mathematical or physics-oriented process. It's plus, 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 plus. So, collapse. And they form and they exactly calculate this behavior. What could it look like? It would look like particles vision. But the growth of the idea of the connection, so let's see. Um, there were a very important observation by a young physicist, well, not so young anymore, he used, to be a, he used to be a young physicist. In fact, he used to be a postdoc here, um, Mark Van Romsdonk in, uh, in Canada, who I think you could probably say it was his basic idea that entanglement is what holds space together. And that when space is held together, it's always entangled. And when it's entangled in the right kind of way, it means that things are juxtaposed in a, uh, in a small Very, very heavily pushed by what is called quantum, quantum information theory. Quantum information theory is uh, basically about how information is stored and the computer program channel complexity. Constantly touching on it. You're not telling me. The other. And I would guess in five years we will know a lot more. Uh, when will we know everything? When will we have a complete theory? Bartek, when will we have a complete theory? <laughs> Never. You're not telling me. I hope you're going to make the complete theory while you're still at Stanford. But it could be 100 years, it could be 50 years, it could be 10 years, it could be who knows, we don't know. Um, next no. time I'll tell you a little bit about quantum complexity and its relationship to the growth of the Einstein-Rosen bridge. As I said, it's the growth which keeps, which prevents signals from being able to go from one side to the other. And, uh, and hopefully I will, we do have another candidate to give another series of short lectures. It's Sean Hartnell, who will also talk about gravity but, and information, but he will be talking about, I believe, the connections between gravity and condensed matter physics, superconductivity, that sort of thing. Very interesting. So we're going to continue, and I'm going to lean on my colleagues uh, till we have everybody telling you what it is that they're interested in. We'll do it over and over and over again. Every time, uh, every time physics changes a little bit, every time they change their minds and say, "Well, I was wrong. Let's do something else," we'll uh, create a history of them. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, I am. For more. Yeah, I apologize. I. The thing is, I'm not tired. I just got up. It just... I appreciate Jacob for the paid request. I appreciate that he has an interest in this. Um, this is just not for me. Not for me at all. I mean... I've said I'm open to pretty much any type of paid request, and I maintain that. I still maintain that. It's just I have to be honest. I can't sit here and lie and say... Yeah, I'm intrigued, so give me more money. Because I'd be lying. I have nothing against people who are into this stuff. Like I said, the, the professor seems like a very nice guy. He definitely knows what he's doing. Um, he seems... He doesn't seem uptight. He doesn't seem prickish. Um, he has all the good qualities of a teacher. And then... For people who are into this, he's going at enough of a basis and a speed so he's not rushing through things and making people confused. Um, it's just to me, I don't know a single thing about this. I don't know a single thing about any of this. And it got to a point where you know, I was literally having a migraine, not understanding what he was saying, not understanding what he was going through entanglements and this is that if you look at it it creates a reaction and 
there's a black hole, there's wormholes. You can't go from here to here, but you can maybe meet in the middle. But it got to a point where I'm like, it's just stuff that's not that interesting to me. Maybe it's one of those things like if there's like a more of like a visual, like some of their explaining this, but there's like really intricate special effects and all sorts of like, or shots of in space if they're able, if they were able to catch up your uh, black hole. I don't know, just a lecture at school would just. My mind kind of just wandered away. So, obviously, I would not have gotten into Stanford. <laughs> but it also depends on how much you're into the subject matter, of course. I guess I'll teach their own, I guess. But thanks once again, Jacob. I apologize for fast forwarding, but it would have been 40 minutes more of just me kind of deadpan, dead faced. And uh, there you go. So, thanks once again, Jacob. Take care, everyone. We'll see you guys later. Bye bye.